Welcome everyone to tonight's special episode of The Good Guy Drinks Whiskey. My guest tonight is the co-host of the new History Channel show, More Power, but most of you will recognize him as the well-known character Al Borland from the great 90s sitcom Home Improvement, that is Mr. Richard Carn. So with that, let me welcome him on to this live stream. Richard, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. I love technology. I just love that this is able to uh, to happen like this. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it uh, it makes connecting with people and being able to chat with uh, with just a whole uh, bunch of different people whenever they want. I mean, this it's really cool. Very cool. It is. I, I mean, it has its drawbacks. I, I mm -hmm. think there's a lot more angst in the world because of this. But yeah, no, this is this is all good. This is a positive uh, conversation. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the whiskey community as a whole is just such a giving, positive place that, uh, and there's almost no negativity in it. So it's really cool just to be able to uh, reach out and connect with different people all over the world through the Instagram platform. It's such a cool thing. I mean, that's how uh, I we, I ended up messaging you, seeing if you were interested in joining me for some whiskey and a chat. And, uh, you know, luckily you uh, responded. So this is great. And, and after a couple of misfires, you know, yes. stuff comes up, things happen. And, uh, now we're here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the 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 big misfire was my uh, trusted uh, sample handler lost the first package, which has still hasn't been found. But uh, luckily... well, I think somebody is actually enjoying whatever it was that you sent me the first time. Was it the same thing? It was the exact same lineup. So maybe they're watching tonight and they're going to sip along with us. Let's well, if they're watching, please, please let us know and see yes. uh, and, and tell us what you thought of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned in our DMs when I first started chatting with you, uh, you know, I, my, I have very fond memories of uh, watching Home Improvement in the 90s with my dad living in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So it's a very nostalgic place for me. So it is really an honor to have you here joining me and sipping on some whiskeys. All right. Well, I, you know, honestly, I don't know if Al Borland um, was was a drinker that much. It, it no. never really came up in in storyline in script you know we we had some scenes at the bar but it was never about that yeah i, uh, I vaguely remember an episode i think it was uh right before al borland got uh was going to get married that uh he was getting egged on to drink something at the bar so i think that might have been the one scene in the whole series where al borland actually drinks alcohol <laughs> he had a rusty nail yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so I do have a bunch of questions for you, but since we have a bunch of samples to get through tonight, I, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll jump into the whiskeys and I'll ask some questions throughout. Um, but my first question is, what is your background in whiskey? You know, how often do you enjoy it, and what is your preferred style? Uh, my background, my background in whiskey. Um, Meaning, like how how often do you drink it? What do you I, like, well, that kind of stuff? I, you know, it's it's interesting because you know my dad growing up didn't drink a lot mm -hmm. he was like you know i get a headache i can't do that every time i do but but when he would go fishing with his guys mm -hmm. up in canada he would always get crown royal all right and yeah for whatever reason that was his go-to thing mm -hmm. he would buy it at the border and he and he would suffer through the headaches yeah yeah or whatever it was that he had and it wasn't until i moved to california and he comes down to visit a few times and i'm watching him i'm you know i'm watching what he does and drinks mm -hmm. for the first time as a, you know, as a cognizant adult. Yeah. And I realize he's not drinking anything but coffee. All right. Yeah. He is so dehydrated that when he drinks, yep. he gets a headache. And that's mm -hmm. why, and he, I don't think he ever realized that or knew that. And yeah. once I got him drinking water, uh, you know, for, for a few days. And then I said, well, let's have, let's have a margarita, you know, yeah. no, I'll get a headache. And he didn't get the headache. He was like, wow. Yeah. What, what happened? I go, well, you're hydrated. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's part of my suggestion to you pre-show was uh, make sure you have a big bottle of water with you because we want to stay hydrated as we sip through the whiskey. That is an essential well, I have part. I have my glass. All right. I, my, I got my ball. Yeah, I, lo I love the uh, cocktail ball you got in there too. That's fantastic. Um, now, I, I know that there's probably some people out there that are really good at creating a clear ice ball. Mm -hmm. I um I haven't bought the paraphernalia yet for that, but but I want to. A friend yeah. of mine had it. It took him like you know a week and a half to to freeze something because yeah. it has to it has to rise. It's like bread. Mm -hmm. It's it's like the most interesting thing. But um, you know, a good clean clear ice ball is you know is a favorite. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. When you want to make a nice cocktail, presentation is a big part of that. You know, the flavor obviously is the most important thing, but if you have that nice clear uh, ball in there with the, the brown liquor and like a nice twist of an orange peel, it's a beautiful sight. Now, I will, I will drink um, scotch or bourbon neat yeah. uh, once in a while. Mm -hmm. But my preference is for it to be a little cold and have a little bit of the ice diluted, you know, yeah. instead, of, instead of pouring in branch water or whatever you want to call it yeah uh, to to soften the the taste or bring out the aroma or whatever but uh yeah i i kind of like a, a cold um yeah shot. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. I always encourage people, you know, drink whiskey the way they enjoy drinking it. Um, I also encourage them for a new whiskey, try it neat, you know, try to explore some of those flavors at, as intended in the bottle. But uh, at the end of the day, if you like it over some ice or you like it with some water, if you like it in a cocktail, then just drink it the way you enjoy it uh, at the end of the day. Now, have you ever gone out and bought yourself a, a, a copper press? No, no, I've never have. How great is that? I yeah. Mean, how cool. You get a block of ice. Yeah. And the copper press goes through the ice like butter. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. You know, the um, whatever the algorithm is with uh, <laughs> copper and, and ice, it goes through it and, and it makes whatever mold uh, the, the press is. It's oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that, that, that is really cool. Um, you know, but, but tonight we'll be drinking them neat, uh, you know, so hopefully you uh, you enjoy them as is. Uh, but, you know, I always, uh, this is the, the, the whiskey nerd in me, is I always have this little water dropper so I can add a few drops of water uh, to kind of soften it for the higher ABV thing, the uh, drinks. But, okay. Uh, well, I brought my shot. Oh, perfect. That's exactly what you need. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first one we're going to drink tonight is the Compass Box oak cross now compass box is, is that a brand you've ever heard of uh yes actually oh, all right very good but now i have it in um well travel form yes exactly you've got the the one ounce that i that i handed off to you and so the reason why we're starting with this one is because it's the lowest abv of the pack it's at 43 percent. so this one will help acclimate our palates a little bit to this high abv uh drink that we're about to consume um so it helps kind of coat it it'll be a little it won't be quite as abrasive as jumping right into something at like 46 50 plus percent so <laughs> this will help this is help this is gonna layer our palate kind of like paint and then each dram we have after this will be a little bit better but it's not just meant for a palate acclimator it's also a very nice well-made straightforward scotch whiskey um and it is a blended malt which means it comes from multiple distilleries this one is mostly klein leash and del ewan uh, two of my favorite distilleries in the uh uh highlands and space side of scotland um now what would you consider is a dram a wee dram a wee dram i usually consider uh you know I think there's a technical definition of something that's a very small quantity, but when I say a dram of whiskey, I usually refer to an ounce and a half, which is the serving size of whiskey. Um, usually on my pours, if I'm having a flight in a night, I'll do about an ounce of the, the various whiskeys I'm having. So that's that's give or take what I, what I uh, measure it as. My understanding is a dram is whatever the person wants it to be. Yeah, so basically... That's... If, they, if they invite you over for a dram or a wee dram, it's whatever they pour. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I can't argue with that. So uh, we're having a wee dram of this Compass Box Oak Cross. Um, and so do you drink bourbon usually, scotch? What's your what's your main whiskey of choice? I, um, I've been doing a lot of different bourbons. Uh, okay. For a while there, scotch got a little too um, medicinal mm -hmm. in my mouth for me. Okay, yeah. And I had to go away from it. Yeah. And to go away from it to come back to it. But now... There are so many interesting things that they can do. You know, they. Mm -hmm. I, I just had one the other day with my brother-in-law that was in a um, a, a cask, a, a Caribbean um, uh, cask of of another liquor. Well, what yeah, the I rum thinking? cask you're thinking of. Right? A rum cask. Yes. Uh, yes. Which made it uh, just a a, sw a smidge more sweeter. Yep. Not sweet, sweet, but yeah. it gave it a, it gave it an a, an interesting taste yeah and i'm guessing like i'm guessing the the whiskey you shared with him was the balveni 14 year old caribbean cask that's one of the most common ones out there um okay. I, I don't know if that's it but if i had to guess that's probably i think that sounds exactly it i think 14 years was was spot on is there like the 
the 18, the 21, the 30? No, no. So it's a very uh, pop. It's probably the most popular rum finished uh, scotch in, in the industry. So it makes sense that that's what it was. Um, and it's, you know, most new scotch drinkers typically kind of go towards the 14 year old just because it has that extra sweetness from the rum. Um, and, and, but you're exactly right with that statement that scotch has so much more freedom in its cask maturations and the way they can make it that you can have a, like every whiskey we have tonight is going to be a little bit different. I mean, we do have an Irish whiskey in here. We do have a rum, so there are going to be significant differences in those, but you'll notice through the first three, uh, quite a bit different in how these are kind of matured. And that's what makes whiskey so cool is that you have such a, an interesting experience and journey as you sip through these. Now, um, do any of these have to wait to open up like wine? Um, you know, some have people, that? Yeah, uh, sometimes it does a little bit of air does kind of help it settle a little bit in the glass uh, or in the bottle. So, if, uh, you know, there's some whiskeys, I'll have the neck pour, which is the first pour out of the bottle. And I'll think it's, oh, this is just okay. I'll let it sit on the shelf for a few months. I come back to it and the slight oxidation really settles it down. So it does help a little bit, but not to the same degree that wine does. Wine is more tannic or tannic in general. So that helps uh, that changes a lot more dramatically in uh, the air. From wine to port in about 45 minutes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, if you let it sit in your glass for 10, 15 minutes, it might help settle it just a little bit. Okay, well, I'm going to join you. Here. All right, cheers. I like, it's um, not syrupy, but it coats, it coats your mouth immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's got a very nice uh, mouthfeel. The viscosity is nice, and especially for a lower ABV one, 43% in the whiskey community is a low ABV. Uh, that's probably a little bit higher than some of the whiskeys that the general consumer drinks is 40% is the, the minimum that you can have. Um, but this one, it does have a very nice viscosity. The whiskey in here is about 10 to 11 years old. So it's not super old, but it just has uh, just enough pleasant oak oakiness to it that uh, really kind of helps. And each, each subsequent sip we take is going to be a little bit better. Um, and you know, you got to coat your mouth a little bit with it. I always like to, you know, get it on my cheeks and everything just so I can really uh, help acclimate that palate to the the flavors I'm tasting, and so <clears throat> this one is matured mostly in ex bourbon casks, which is a very common cask maturation for uh, Scotch. It's a it's an affordable one, but it also helps gives you some of those uh, slightly more bright fruits, tropical fruit flavors. Like, well, let me ask you this: Is there a Scottish bourbon? No. So bourbon is a, uh, a whiskey that needs to be made in the United States. Um, there are grain scotch whiskeys that can use a, an assortment of uh, different types of grains. But uh, what we're drinking tonight are mostly single or uh, malted scotch whiskeys. Um, so this is a blended malt. It's 100% malted barley. Bourbon needs to be at least 51% corn. And then it has some rye or wheat or uh, barley added to it. So um, that's why bourbon is so much sweeter. Because you have to use virgin oak casks. It has a lot of corn, which is sweet by nature. So you get that right. bold sweetness. But it tends to be, at least in my opinion, a little bit more one-dimensional. I do like bourbon, but scotch is a little more nuanced to me than, uh, than a bourbon would be. I like this. Yeah, this is a nice, this is a nice, pleasant one. Um, you know, I get a little bit of maltiness to it. Uh, oh, and uh, yeah, we have a comment on here. My one of my buddies, uh, Chris, the single malt savvy. He wants to know, uh, do you like that blue box of Macallan Thirty in the background? He, he noticed it. His eyes went straight to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you what. Uh, remember two years ago when we shut down for COVID? Yeah. Well, I'm hanging out at the house. And, and I start to think, well, you know what? I haven't cleaned out rooms in a while. Yeah. So I went to one of my rooms, one of the rooms, the pool table room. Mm -hmm. And I start taking stuff out, dusting it off, seeing what's there. I found two boxes of 30-year-old McKellen that two I boxes. completely forgot about. Oh, wow. Two boxes. I have no idea. It could have been 15 years, it could have been 20 years ago, but I put them away, I knew they were special, and I find them, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm like, wow. So I immediately open one. Yeah, of course. I, I just, I immediately open it, and the, the cork crumbles. Oh yeah, that, that's cork, gonna happen. The cork yeah. crumbles, yeah. and so I've got all this crumbled cork in, in the scot, and I'm going, yeah. oh, ah. And so now I gotta go, find a, a, a sieve or yep. uh, you know uh, something I I actually I went out to the store and I bought like a little um, uh, uh, strainer yeah yeah and I strained it into 
one of our my decanters. I yeah. you know, every once in a while I, I will get a decanter at some function or whatever. This one I got at one of the last uh oh shoot, um Bing Crosby mm -hmm. golf tournaments yeah. years ago. But mm -hmm. it was a this beautiful crystal you know, decanter and I poured it in there and my immediately I thought, well, do you do you put scotch into a decanter? Well, yeah, you do, because I see that in movies, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. So it should be okay. And I, you know, I strained it out. And I, I drank on that decanter for about a good six months. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't rush through it. No, no, of course not. You know, I had some friends over, let them know what it was. They, they were duly impressed. Oh, yeah. I mean, McCallum 30, for most people, is not accessible anymore. It's just... Well, now I have this one. Yeah. And it's like, okay, what do I do now? Yeah. You know, when do I open it? I made the mistake of looking online how much it is. And <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. It's now it's worth like six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I uh, I truly think maybe I should just sell it and mm -hmm. buy a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> other scotches and whiskeys. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm in a quandary there. Yeah. No. Actually, uh, you know the the last because the chances are. Uh, the whiskey's not going to live up to the six thousand dollar price tag, um, and I would be happy to to give you some recommendations uh, on, on <laughs> what you could buy for six thousand dollars. That is a, a trade. You can buy half my shelf back here. For $6, oh my god! Price. Perfect. Perfect. No, no. Uh, but uh, and if you do decide to open it, just be very careful with the cork because clearly, if one crumbled, the other might. I, be I don't think there's anything I can do. I, it's either going to crumble or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, some people what they do is. Uh, uh, and then it's probably too late for that, but every like six months or so, they'll, they'll turn their whiskey upside down in the bottle and then turn it back just to keep the cork moist. Um, but uh, at this point, it's either crumbled already or it's not. So, you know, you just have to cross your fingers and hope that this one's okay. Well, that's true. I could I could saturate it, but then I would lose some of that great whiskey. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to lose any of that. That's like gold right there. It's, you know, you bought that back uh, 15, 20 years ago, and uh, it probably had the same rate increases like Bitcoin from 2008. So, you know, that's a, that's a piece of gold you got back there. Uh, Scotch Bitcoin. Yes, I love exactly. that. Exactly. Uh, somebody's asking what we're drinking. Uh, we just uh, finished up the uh, Compass Box Oak Cross, and we're going to jump right into that uh, Del Ewan, 23-year-old. Now, is that a distillery you've ever heard of, Del Ewan? Del Ewan, no. Uh, what what province is that in? De so this is this is a Speyside Scotch whiskey, and it is used mostly for blends, uh, in particular Johnny Walker. So Johnny Walker uh, owns Del Ewan Distillery, and they use most of their whiskey to put in the, their various Johnny Walker blends. Um, but sometimes they sell some of their casks to independent bottlers, which is what this is. So this is uh, from the independent bottler Signatory. And it is a 23-year-old Del Ewan matured in Hogshead, which is ex-bourbon casks, uh, bottled at cash strength. So we're going up from 43% ABV to 51% ABV. So it's going to be a little bit spicier, but it should also be more. Lit. So it's it's not blended. It's it's um, this it's is a single, single barrel. Mug. Yeah, it's a single. Yeah, single. Actually, it's uh two barrels. So two barrels uh, blended together in a vat. Uh, but it is a single malt scotch whiskey. So in order to be a single malt scotch whiskey, it needs to all come from the same distillery. doesn't matter w what age the barrels are. It can be a blend of any barrels as long as it comes from a single distillery. So we have a single malt scotch whiskey from Del Ewan. Well, when I was in, um, when I was in Scotland yeah. uh, years ago, I did, uh, I did an episode of, um, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous mm -hmm. with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what's his name? The host. Uh, oh gosh, I, somebody I, should I'm come up sure. with it. Yeah. Um, oh, I can hear his Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous <laughs> with Richard Kahn. I'm. Oh, I can't think of his name. That's what happens when you get old. <laughs> I'll, I'll do a quick Google search. Please, uh, someone will know. Uh, Robin Leach. Robin Leach. There we go. Robin Leach and I went to Ballantine. Ballantine. No. Ballantine. Yeah, Ballantine. Ballantine. Yeah, yeah. And I know what you're talking about. Ballantine. Ballantine. And I, um, I, I took a little tour, and this guy, you know, the the creator, was walking me around, and he goes, "I, I got something for you. Try this." Mm -hmm. And he pours me a wee drop, you know, just a wee shot. Yeah, yeah. I took a sip, and my whole body got hot. Yeah. I mean, it just went. Whoosh! Mm -hmm. I went. Whoa! He goes. I. I. Now that's mm -hmm. great. Now I'm gonna do this, and he pours what he calls branch water. 
Mm -hmm. I haven't figured out what branch water is. Yeah, I, I don't it, even know what that is. Maybe the water of the of the era or, or, or of the region or whatever. The next sip was so smooth, mm -hmm. and he didn't pour a lot in. He just yeah. put a drop in. Mm -hmm. It was like it, it was like a totally different drink. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it that's... was thirty year old, single barrel. Yeah, well, that's that's and incredible. They're they're known for blended, but he yeah. goes, yep. we've got this, you know, by itself, you know, so." Um, all right, I'm going to pour this now. Yeah, so the Del Yuen, uh, and, and that's, yeah, so, and Valentine's is typically a blended one, so they probably dipped into one of their casks to share with you, which would have been an incredible experience. That's that's part of the beauty of going out to Scotland is because you're you're in the uh, the environment where the whiskey was made. So, uh, you know, and when you drink it there, context adds a lot to the whiskey that you're drinking. Um, the people you're sharing it with, the place you're drinking it from, um, add, I mean, it all helps add to the experience. Um. Well, the the thing about this is, and and maybe it's just me, but I, I think it's also a lot of your of your viewers. Yeah, I'm not drinking this to get drunk. Oh no, 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 absolutely not. So I take it slow. Mm -hmm. I savor it. I enjoy it. I'm not yeah. gulping it down. No, you know, absolutely it's not, not. It's not like a uh, Jack Daniels with a Coke back or yeah, exactly. you know, whatever people are, are doing, but. Yeah, no, and that's something that's important to recognize. I mean, whiskey in general can be a dangerous substance. I mean, it's high ABV, and it's not something you want to abuse. So it is 100% about the experience, about the, you know, you've got the nose, you've got the taste, you've got the mouthfeel, and then the experience of who you're with while you're sharing it. It all adds to the effect of the, the what you're drinking, and it adds to it. So we're all in this for the, the journey and the, the experience that we're having with it, not to get drunk. That's the last thing in our minds. All right, so this one on the palate, you can tell it's a lot. It's, it's, you get that spiciness from the higher ABV. Um, a bit more spice, a little less oak. Yep. Um, for me, I get a lot of like tropical fruits. I get some, some uh, like mangoes, pineapple, some coconuts to it, um, and some like nice gentle vanilla and honey. I mean, this is a very well aged um, Scotch whiskey, and I mean it's not a dark whiskey either. So the color comes more from the uh what the cask was used previously so this is 23 years old but it's a very light color because that's from the ex-bourbon cask that doesn't most of the color was already sucked out from the bourbon that was aging in it before so it just has a very gentle color influence um but the longer it ages in ex-bourbon casks the more uh tropical fruity it gets a little more creamy it gets which uh in this one is really nice and you know you can add a couple of drops of water if you want to see how that mellows it out a little bit um just because it is 51 percent abv and we're going up in ABVs too. There's a couple down at the end that uh, are cask strength, so it'll slowly get a little bit spicier as we go on. You're right. I mean, th there is there is a lot more of that that fruity, but but there's still a bite. There's still kind of like a bite yeah. at the back of your uh, back of your throat mm -hmm. that happens. But it's it's a lovely aftertaste. It's not uh, you know it, it doesn't go away, but it it doesn't stay really strong for a while yeah no no the the finish isn't super long on this one um but the, this one for me this is a flavor profile that i really enjoy um and one that if you have a full bottle of you can kind of really experience and see how it evolves and your palate evolves with it uh but i really love how this is matured and just that well aged ex bourbon cask uh, maturation those uh strong fruity uh tropical uh, pineapples and whatnot just are really really nice for this whiskey wow well, you know, when you talk about blended, um, I have a friend that that um, puts product into movies and television shows. Mm -hmm. And one of his products is Johnny Walker Blue. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, not ever experiencing it, you know, yeah. I, say, I go, well, it's a blended scotch. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, that much, you know, the uh, a tip of your fingernail could be you know, 30 years old, but the rest could be, you know, it's blend. Yeah. You know, how do you, you know, he goes, you'll know, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to leave you a bottle. Yeah. So I try it New Year's Eve mm -hmm. and I, and I'm blown away. I'm like, wow. Yeah. This, there, there is a step up. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause I've done red, green, black, double black. Yeah. Uh, which is a little smoother than just black. Yeah, yeah, or, or not as as peaty, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, so the blend the blended thing uh, 
doesn't bother me as much anymore. No, no, and uh, that that it was an old kind of misconception with blended whiskeys and Compass Box. The first one we had is a brand that's kind of trying to dispel that rumor that blends are of lower class because you can make some very well-made special blends out there with old stock and just a different combination of flavors to create a beautifully crafted whiskey. Uh, some of my favorite whiskeys of all time are blends, so I, I have no issues with that. Johnny Walker, I do enjoy it. I do think uh, it's more geared towards the casual drinker. Once you kind of dive into whiskeys a little bit more, you kind of uh, deviate away from Johnny Walker. A, because it's you're paying a premium that may not be worth it. And then B, you, um, you tend to start liking higher proof whiskeys and Johnny Walker's at 40%. Whereas, you know, this is 51%. You're going to get a little bit more layers and uh, some kind of uh, nuances that you won't necessarily get in a low proof whiskey. Okay. Um, but how do you like the Del is in? Is it is it's better or worse? Uh, do you like it better or worse than the Oak Cross, the one we had previously? I I don't know if my palate is sophisticated enough to, to feel, you know, a big a big difference mm -hmm. and they both had their you know their qualities yeah and none of them put me off mm -hmm. i mean i've had some stuff that that puts me off right away and i go ah, i don't i don't need to, to do this yeah no that's fair um and you know the 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 thing with whiskey is it does take practice basically you do have to sip on whiskeys on a fairly regular basis to kind of start building out your palate and to um really kind of taste the nuances and differences between whiskeys. When I first was getting into my whiskey journey, it did take me a little while to kind of start tasting those nuances and differences. I always enjoyed what I was drinking, but it does take some basically tasting it, tasting it with other people, getting their thoughts and opinions, and then you can kind of build out a profile in your mind of what to expect, what you're tasting, and that kind of stuff. So it is something to take some time for sure. Well, the thing is, when you're doing a blended, you, the, you have to create a consistency. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you make one bottle that is like far and above anything else you produce after that, that's that's kind of weird. That's, yeah. uh, you know, uh, in a way, that's kind of what they're trying to do with with um, strains of marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. They're trying to create the same experience mm -hmm. by blending it or, or, or whatever um, uh, so that you you don't get a different experience every time you buy the same bottle. Yeah. So I'm, yep. I'm just, you know, wondering if there's like some amazing blends out there that only happened, you know, once in a while and, and we weren't around to experience it. Yeah, no, that, that absolutely does happen. And that's, you're hundred percent right. There are some brands that take, uh, that pride themselves in consistency. They want to taste the whiskey to taste almost exactly the same from batch to batch. Um, so Johnny Walker is a perfect example. They're blending their whiskeys. So Johnny Walker black from today tastes the same as it does 10 years from now. They want that consistency. But some of more some of the more craft distilleries, they 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 release whiskey at on batches. So they'll tell you this is batch one, batch two. This is the September 2019 batch. So you know exactly what you're getting with that batch, and that each batch will have their differences. Some are going to be better than others. Some are going to have this characteristic, and others are going to have that, that characteristic. Well, now be because of shows like yours and and other venues, yeah. does that just go on fire and like all oh, of yeah. a sudden batch 27 is you know there's only 125 bottles left yeah yeah ex no that's exactly what happens so if a if a batch comes out that's like better a better cut than most then uh that will sell out quickly through the whiskey enthusiasts out there who talk about them and uh then they're just hard to get so yeah that that's uh part of the community is see seeking out those those uh, releases that are special so is there a black market uh, uh out there, you know, for currency of, of amazing whiskeys that, uh, there are, that can there are trade? Some, there are some groups out there that, uh, you know, in Facebook and whatnot, where the, the exclusive whiskeys, and in the United States, the bourbon, the allocated bourbon market is this, the insane market because, you know, you get a uh, George T. Stagg or a Pappy Van Winkle. Those things are almost impossible to get at a reasonable price. So there's a lot well, of That's uh, because they don't make a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, and they control the markets to some degree too. Uh, but then you have a lot of people who buy it and yeah. they just go yeah. drink it. They just well, they were, it close. I mean, they were using Pappy for um, mint juleps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, before it got like really popular, mm -hmm. it was just kind of for mint juleps. And why would you do that? Yeah. You know, mint julep isn't, you know, isn't as great as just a, uh, you know, a shot of Pappy. No, yeah, exactly. A friend of mine, um, 
who had a radio show for years and years, Rick Dees. Do you do you remember mm -hmm. that name, Rick Dees? Uh, no, it, it doesn't. doesn't well, he that. has a farm in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And half of his farm, he has hemp, and the other half, he has corn that he sells to Pappy. Yeah. That's... Because it's non-GMO. He doesn't put any insecticides or anything like that. And they yeah. buy half of his farm for their... For their uh, so every once in a while, he gets a couple of good bottles that's uh, awesome that he shares with us but yeah no it's it's good to have that inside connection because otherwise it's tough to get i know nowadays i know okay here we go all right number three we are looking at the so it's pronounced anak the first c is silent um this comes from the knock do distillery in the highlands of scotland now why is why do they have a c there if it's silent it's uh, part of the Gaelic language, so uh, it's a Gaelic name, and their spellings are very strange compared to their pronunciation. So it's uh, even though there's an A N C N O C, it's just Anak. Well, I, I, maybe the original pronunciation had the C in there. Uh, I'm not. Sh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very possible that it that it did, and it was just too hard to say, so they just took it out. But uh, there's a lot part of the of Highland Games. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a lot of whiskeys in uh, uh, a lot of distillery names in Scotland that are uh, based in Gaelic, which is a very strange language. You, you see the spelling and the pronunciation is nothing like the spelling, so it's just well, it's way. strange now, but at the time it was. Oh yeah, it was normal. It was how people communicated. And, yeah, and, and and then London refined mm -hmm. or, or whatever, and then yeah. we, and then we did our version. Okay, I'm opening it. All right, so this is a 24-year-old uh, single malt scotch whiskey. It all comes from the Nakdu Distillery, um, and it's in the Highlands. And this is where we're introducing a little bit of sherried influence whiskey into our uh, into our lineup. So the previous ones were all ex bourbon. This one is a combination of ex bourbon casks and ex sherry casks. So it'll typically uh, what the sherry does is it adds some like dark chocolate, some uh, some dark fruits, prunes, raisin notes to the whiskey. So l let me know if you can taste those, if this one tastes any different than the previous ones you did. Oh no, I can immediately smell it. Yeah, yeah, it's got a different nose to it entirely. Yeah, it's got it's got a very nice nose. This one this one uh, does uh, you know this one kind of throws people uh, you're like oh this I can I can notice the difference in this one. This is a, a common one for sure. And it's twenty four. 24 years old, so it's an older one. And what most whiskey enthusiasts love about the Anak 24 is, A, it's not a common distillery, so most people don't know about it, and B, it's a phenomenal value. A 24-year-old whiskey of this quality for most distilleries would run you about $300, $250, dollars but you still can get this whiskey, at least in the UK, for about $150, which is an insane value for what you're getting in the, in the glass here. Really? Yeah, this is a a high a high value very well made whiskey in my opinion but i'll let you be the judge let me know what you think cheers i immediately get like dark lit back rooms mm -hmm. all right town. you know it's like and and big overstuffed chairs this is mm -hmm. this is something that's that's really kind of you know uh it would be special to be in this room. Yeah. And you know, I love the way you describe that because that the way you described it illustrates the age of it. That that's the description of an old a well aged whiskey, something that's in his twenties. And that's what you get with this. You do get some of those, you know, on the nose you can get kind of like that old library feel to it. It's a, just a very pleasant nose. Yeah. Well people are or um, people are starting to open things like spe speakeasies or back back rooms that aren't populated that, that you have mm -hmm. no somebody to get back there. And yeah. this is the kind of thing that you should be drinking next to the fire. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is a special whiskey without a doubt. One that uh, you say for special occasions or to wow your guests be like, all right, try out this well-aged Anak. Yeah. I'm, um, I'll take a case. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, this stuff is so good. Uh, and it usually impresses people. I had a live stream uh, a couple of weeks ago with a, a well-known bartender in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, when he first had this, it kind of blew him away. It's like, wow, this is... He, he described it as an old-fashioned in single malt form. He's like, I could just see myself putting an orange twist and an ice cube with this, and it would be your old, it would be an old-fashioned uh, because it's got such good character as is. Now, is there... You know the reason behind it's a it's a ten year it's a twelve year yeah. it's an eighteen year it's a twenty one mm -hmm. is there a reason behind the different companies having different 
age? Well, so the age, uh, first of all, the, the rule behind that is that the, the distillery needs to put the, the age of the youngest whiskey in the bottle. So if you have a, a 21 year old whiskey, there could be older whiskey in it, but by law, they have to say, all right, the youngest in this bottle is 21 years old. So that's what the age is. And, um, the longer it's aged, the more character it can develop, the, a little bit more oakiness, uh, and it kind of adds some layers to the whiskey. And then it also takes longer, so it takes up more space in your floor. That's why they tend to be more expensive. So it really is the expectation that the, uh, the older the whiskey, the better the experience will be. That's not always the case. In fact, I've had some young whiskeys that are some of my favorites that I've ever had. Um, yeah. So it can be a little misleading. But in general, when you get an older whiskey, you tend to get more de delicate flavors, a little bit more subtle, a little bit more oakiness to them. So um, you're kind of paying for those nuances uh, at those older ages. So when they blend them, that's it. I mean, they put this age, this age, this age, this age, and they bottle it. Yeah. That's it. That There's no more aging to that bottle no exactly once it's in the glass bottle it doesn't age anymore it all all the age comes from the oak oak cast so the 20 years that my bottle has been in my client in my closet yeah it's still the same as it was 30 yep. years ago it's still a 30 year old mccallan it's not a 50 year old mccallan unfortunately <laughs> though uh it would be an older vintage so you would still probably sell for a premium premium on the markets just because it was from 20 years ago um it's a, and it's cool it's a cool concept too if you bought that and say 2005 then you know the whiskey in the bottle is from the 70s which is really cool it was distilled it was created in the 70s so it's a bit of a time capsule you know from yeah. the time it was created to the aging process it spent 30 years in that barrel what has happened over the 30 years what kind of characteristics did that whiskey absorb well the alchemy of, of putting blends together in the last mm -hmm. 15 20 30 years mm -hmm. have probably you know gotten a lot better Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's about it's becoming a lot more scientific, uh, and just you know, there's a, there are so many distilleries opening up in Scotland right now. It's hard to keep up with them, just because it's, there's we're at the whiskey boom right now, and uh, all of them or a lot of them create such wonderful whiskeys, even at super young ages. Uh, it needs to be at least three years old to be considered a whiskey, and some of these these distilleries are releasing three, four, five year old whiskeys that are very well made. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's the the prime time for uh, whiskey drinking in the markets right now. So you're a fan of the, the Anak 24. I, I'm assuming this is your favorite of the, of the group tonight so far. So far, this is my favorite, even though we can't pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, they do help you out on the bottle. It does say pronounced Anak. So no they way. Do, they give yeah, you they, the pronunciation? They give you the pronunciation on the bottle, so they do help you out for sure. All right. No, that's great. Love uh, that. I did get a question earlier in the chat. Uh, somebody was just curious. Any uh, any new interesting projects you're working on right now? Uh, you know, um, I, I have a show on the History Channel right now. Mm -hmm. Yep, more power, right? More power. And last yep. year, uh, when when we were at the height of of COVID, we it was called Assembly Required, mm -hmm. and it's a different show this year. It's yep. it's um, it's not as much a competition as it is just us you know getting together and and just you know b talking and bullshitting and, and stuff like that yeah. and we actually have the sets tim still has the home improvement set mm -hmm. he has the set from last man standing yeah and every once in a while we end up on that set uh just you know talking just asking yeah. you know random questions to each other yeah no that's awesome that, that's got to be such a cool experience to kind of go back into those uh stages of where basically you created sitcom history and just chat with uh with the uh, tim and, and the rest of them that's really cool. and it brings up a lot of things that you don't remember yeah you know yeah. it's like i i literally i have to go back and watch the show again because it's mm -hmm. been so many years there's stuff that i've forgotten yeah no absolutely and the challenge with that now is that I was actually, uh, it's just two, three, four years ago, I was rewatching Home Improvement, and then it just disappeared from Hulu, and now it can't be found anywhere to stream on any streaming network, unless you pay for it on Amazon Prime, uh, and that's a shame. There's no reason why Home Improvement shouldn't be on it is. one of the streaming services. It is, a sh it is a shame, and I I, I don't know all of the particulars, I just know that, that um, you know, it's always, it always comes down to bottom line. Yeah, yeah, of you course. Know? The producers are still, uh, you know, arguing with each other about certain aspects of what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, no, that makes sense. And it was never, it was, it was never an artistic thing. It yeah. was, it, it was uh, an odd thing where um, the creators of the show, Wind Dancer, 
mm -hmm. uh, which was Matt Williams, David McFadzian, and Carmen Finestra. Mm -hmm. They were approached by Disney to create a show for Tim Allen. Yeah. And they came up with this variation of a family man who also has a show that's on a tool time show, uh, local access cable show or whatever. And so Wind Dancer and the TV arm of Disney, which was Buena Vista Television, yeah, produced the show and sold it to ABC. Well, a year into our run, Disney bought ABC. Mm -hmm. So now they want to sell the show to themselves for less. Mm -hmm. Wind Dancer's going, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we don't want to sell. We, you know, we don't want less. We we can get more. We can take it to NBC. We can take it to CBS. Uh, you know, so uh, that's kind of the nucleus of of why it's not on Disney Plus. Yeah, yeah, which is it's such a shame because it's such a uh, you know for people of my generation, it's such a nostalgic show to to rewatch and you can it will it eventually. I know it will eventually. You know, yeah. but. But there, there has to be cooler heads. I think if we all sat in a room with these scotches, we, oh, could, come yes. to, we could come to an agreement. I, this, I firmly agree, agree with that. Decisions would be made with a nice glass of single malt scotch whiskey. It's, it solves many problems, and you can't argue when you're enjoying a nice whiskey with good company, without a doubt. Ready for uh, pour number four? You still feeling okay? You're not uh, the, the alcohol's not hitting you too hard yet? Uh no, I've been I've been very you know I haven't poured big glasses. I've had a couple of really good tastes. All right, good. So I can save this bottle for another shot. Absolutely, and that's the beautiful thing about whiskey is that it lasts indefinitely. You don't have to necessarily rush to it. So uh, I'm glad, and maybe that second package will show up at your house one day, and you'll have to you'll be able to retaste all of them. <laughs> That'd be great. That would be great. Um, so this next one, we're changing gears a little bit here. We are going to drink an Irish whiskey. So there are a few key dis, uh, things about Irish whiskeys that are commonly true. They're not steadfast, but the first one is uh, Scotch whiskey, for the most part, is double distilled, um, meaning they, they take the, 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 the uh, basically the wash, they distill it once, then they have the, the what's called the low wines, and they distill it again to make the spirit, which is aged in barrels. Uh, Irish whiskey, for the most part, doesn't have to be, is triple distilled so they do that dis distillation one more time and what that does is it takes out some more of those uh congeners some of those flavors in the in the whiskey in the natural spirit and it kind of smooths it out so a lot of people will describe irish whiskey as a little bit smoother and that's part of the reason is the triple distillation and then another key distinction is uh most of the whiskeys we've had tonight were all malted whiskeys 100 percent malted barley this one is a single pot still whiskey and what that means is it all comes from one distillery, but it uses both malted and unmalted barley. So that'll give it a little bit more of a grassy, uh, like hay-like flavor profile to it that the 100% malted barley doesn't provide. So you'll have to let me know what your impression is. And another, the last, the final step is this one is at cask strength. It was a 57.6% ABV. So it's going to come off as a little bit spicier, but uh, cask maturation, ex-bourbon, ex-sherry. So it's similar to the one we just had. Uh, so yeah, you, right off the bat, you can smell that higher ABV, right? Yes, uh -huh. it, goes, it went right to my ocular nerve. Yeah, so the one thing that uh, I always tell people, especially who aren't as familiar with drinking whiskey, is when you nose it, you know, keep a reasonable distance and breathe through your nose and your mouth at the same time. And that will cut down some of that alcohol burn. You can kind of smell those cast characteristics a little bit better. It won't hit, it won't hit you like full on like spiciness right in your senses. That's kind of how I have to be around Tim. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, I actually, that bean uh, burrito, I got to I gotta keep my mouth yeah. open. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, before before jumping on here, uh, I watched uh, an episode of your More Power uh, series, the Blades episode, which was uh, a lot of fun. So I, I enjoyed that episode. Very educational and, and well-made. I, I enjoyed it. All right. All right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. No. Okay, absolutely. here we go. All right. Let me know. It's going to be spicy right off the bat. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it hits the back of your mouth a lot harder. Yep. But then it like blooms. Yep. It, it like whoosh. Mm hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a good candidate for a little bit of water if you want. I'm going to add a few drops into mine just to kind of smooth it out a little bit. So for me, this is just full of, uh, full of character. I really like it's got a bit of a black licorice tones to it from the, yeah. the sherry influence. And I absolutely love. The uh, the freshness and like the the grassiness that comes with that unmalted barley. 
aspect. You know, until, until you said uh, black licorice, yeah, I I couldn't I couldn't put my finger on it, mm -hmm. but it it you know without it being black licorice, yeah, you know, yeah. it it has that kind of yeah, a little bit of yeah. aftertaste. Yeah, yeah, it's it's got a slight bitterness to it, which which can be pleasant in a whiskey if it's not overdone. Um, and uh, I mean, for me, this is just a, an example of a very well aged whiskey or a very well made crafted whiskey. It's not super old, twelve years old, uh, but it's just uh, they they picked the right casks for it and they had the right spirit, and it just everything integrates so well in this whiskey. This is a this is a common like a go to uh, you know Irish whiskey for me without a doubt. Is there a, um, where in Ireland? Um, this one comes from the Middletown, uh, the, the the new Middleton uh, distillery. Where in Ireland? Uh, I, I'm not as up to date on the, the locations of Irish distilleries, but I can just tell you it's in the, in the country of Ireland. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, it's not, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, Kentucky bourbon has to be Kentucky. Yeah. Because yeah. of the shale in the ground. Yeah, now, yeah. I guess there aren't different parts of Ireland where, uh, you know, the the product is different. Well, so the the environment can influence the end product. You know, if you have coastal distilleries and the bo the barrels are being aged on the coast, sometimes it'll get some of those salty, coasty characteristics. Just because as it ages over years and decades, in some cases, it tends to absorb some of the atmospheric flavors you know so if you're by the sea it can absorb some of that saltiness if you're uh you know by various locations it can kind of those characteristics can be picked up a little bit that's lovely yeah so this is nice right this is like a a surprisingly very nice whiskey uh and it's re and it's reasonably priced too i mean you can find this fairly regularly for around 80 ish dollars so i mean it's it's not a bad price and for me it is 100 percent worth the price to admission i mean this is a very nice sipper Mm -hmm. I, I think this this might be how I, I want to do all of my whiskey drinking now. I want it in flights. Yeah, I, I no. Just want, I just want one or two sips. I don't want a full glass. I, you know, I want to I want to just you know progress through the different counties. Oh, yes. we're in the county Cork now. Now we're back <laughs> in the, uh, the Isle of Man. Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, I 100% I agree with that. Most often when I'm drinking whiskey, I do it in a similar fashion because it's just so nice to compare and contrast the different flavor profiles. And that's how you can really build out your uh, your your palate is to taste the nuances and the differences between two whiskeys back to back. Um, it really can help kind of evolve your uh, drinking experience. And, that's, and this is why I love whiskey so much is because everything we've had tonight has been different and interesting, all made with very similar ingredients. And yet... We're having vastly different experiences as we progress through the flight. So it's, it's such a cool, such a cool thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, now it makes me want to go back. And I've been to yeah. Scotland three times, but I haven't been to Ireland yet. All right. Uh, uh, which parts of Scotland have you been to? Um, well, the first time I went to Scotland, I went up there because I was in um, I was in a theater program, and we did the Edinburgh Festival. All right. Yeah. So I lived in Edinburgh for a month, and you know, it was it was really great. Walking oh, yeah. around, getting to know that town, and, and of course, you know, you got the castle at the top of the hill, which is very, you know, romantic. And then you've got basically Holyrood Castle down at the bottom of yeah. of the Royal Mile, which I guess is what they used for the Diagon Alley in in Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. Alley is is that is that cobblestone between you know Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Castle. Yeah. And then the next time I went uh, was with Robin Leach. And, mm -hmm. and and we uh, we went up to Skibo Castle, which was mm -hmm. about an aisle nor or about an hour north of Inverness. And, okay. You know, very different feeling. Some great golf, some great scotch, some great <laughs> some great food actually. Yeah. And then the third time I went back, and we did we did um, we toured some of the other uh, counties and things like that. And then I went over to uh, shoot. Um, Glasgow. All right. Yeah. Yep. Which is a little, you know, more kind of Western industrial. Yes, definitely. So, but gorgeous. Yeah, no, that's... It's a, and I, and I've never made, taken the boat trip, you know, across over to Ireland. And I, I'm chagrined to say that, and I will do it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I've been to both Scotland and Ireland and my preference is 
Scotland, because uh, it has a lot of what Ireland has to offer, just in a grander scale. Uh, but I'm actually going to Ireland, uh, to Scotland uh, with my dad and a couple of other people um, in uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'm I'm ex very excited to go jump in and uh, to go to enjoy the the various distilleries we're going to and the cuisine, which is sneaky good in Scotland. You don't think necessarily cuisine when you go to Scotland, but well, it is, just, uh, you know. Be sure the haggis is spiced. Yes, yes. You, you do need, if you're going to have traditional Scottish food, you have to make sure you approach it in the right manner. But uh, they have a lot of French influence in their cuisine. And uh, you can go, they have some really remarkable restaurants. And, and then just the scenery and the hiking and everything out there is spectacular. Uh, I'm not much of a golfer, but my uncle is. So he's going to be going to uh, uh, Macrahanish in Campbelltown and um, Cape Cruden Bay up in a Aberdeen or outside of Aberdeen. So he'll be doing that. So yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that trip. That should be a lot uh, of fun. I'm envious. I'm in yeah, that's yeah, no, no. yeah, absolutely. So the, you know that's a, that'll be part of the uh, the whiskey experience too. So I'll be documenting our trip out there in a few weeks. <laughs> All right. So are you ready to uh, jump on to dram number five? Dram number five. Now this is a this is a this is a um, a scotch that that a friend of mine that I play with. It's become his only thing he drinks. All right, the lot the Lagavulin. Yeah, Jimmy Heyman. He uh, right. he he directed CSI mm -hmm. uh, New Orleans, um, judging you know just a, a ton of things. And this is what he drinks. Now yeah. I don't know if it's the twelve. He might go up to the sixteen or the sixteen is the most common. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So so uh, Lagavulin. Uh, they they have a few core range whiskeys. The 16 is the most common. Then they have an eight year old and then their 12 year old, which is what we have here is actually their special release. This is their best of the lineup without a doubt. Oh, the this is the best. This is the best standard release by Lagavulin annually. So after 12 years, it goes down a little bit to 16. So what happens is their 12 year old is bottled at, as a natural product. So it's cast strength. We're looking at 56. Let me see what the ABV is on this one. So here's the bottle that we're, we're drinking from. This is the 2021 edition, uh, bottled at 56.5%. So this is a natural cast strength. And I don't know what they do, but they use their best barrels for their special release. And it just packs such a wonderful, powerful experience that it's hard to compete with. Uh, the 16-year-old is their mass-marketed one. It's bottled at 43%, so they water it down quite a bit. Um, and it's more approachable to the casual drinker than the 12-year-old. But the 12-year-old, for whiskey enthusiasts, this is where you want to go with Lagavulin. And it's the more pricey one, this one. So I'm, I imagine they have you know master brewers that, that check out the barrel. They taste it and they go, oh, this is going yep. to 12, this is going to 16, this is going to 8. Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, so they, there's a master distiller at every distillery, and yes, they'll they'll reserve the best casks for their special 12 year old release without a doubt. So if it's not up to standards, they'll say let's age it for four more years. It'll go into the 16 year old, um, okay. and and the price but they'll te good. they'll test it at eight and go it's not ready yet. Uh, yeah, I mean they'll 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 be tasting and testing the whiskey barrels uh, throughout the whole maturation process. Um, their eight year old is something that I really enjoy too. I actually prefer their eight year old even to their sixteen year old um, whiskey. The sixteen for me is a little, for me when I have a peated whiskey like this, I need it to be at a high proof because it needs to pack that additional punch and integrate that peat a little bit better than the lower watered down one. So that's why the twelve hits the the sweet spot for me. Um, and it's it's the pricier one too. This one costs about $150, whereas the 16 year old is about $100. So it's a, you know, you can see the difference in price too. Well, I can, I, I definitely the peat has just, you know, um, charged out yeah. uh, into my nose. Um, when, yeah. I, when I was staying at Skibo Castle, they didn't have showers. Yeah. So you had to take baths mm -hmm. and they had these giant, you know, baths in the bathroom and you'd fill it up in the, and the water was like, a little colored, discolored, yeah. But, but it was clean, fresh water. But it smelled peaty, so mm -hmm. you were actually taking, taking a bath in kind of peaty water. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really cool. And I mean, the the reason why peat peated whiskey exists is because that was a a common heating source in Scotland, especially in regions that didn't have a lot of forest. So the they would heat their homes and their water with peat, so you'd have that nice earthy smell. Um, uh, 
you know, in basically permeating throughout your house. And so, whereas Speyside and inland Scotland, they had trees to, to heat, to dry the barley. Uh, Isla, which is where Lagavulin comes from, they had primarily peat, which burned great, but it adds that nice, uh, smoky, earthy characteristic to the Scotch whiskey, if you like that style. Well, peat is basically why there was London fog. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Interesting. They, you know, and they, they figured it out after, you know, everybody was, was you know, staying warm. Yeah. Cooking or, or burning peat in their little fireplaces. And it would, the smoke would just stay there, would just lay there and become fog. Yeah. They finally decided, well, you know, we can't do that. That's, yeah. uh, you know, we, we need to breathe. So, yeah, exactly. Um, here we go. go. Yeah, let's, let's, let's dig into this. So, obviously... You get the sharpness from that high ABV, 56%. Maybe a couple of drops of water will help mellow that a little bit. Um, and a, another a thing that you'll notice, the more peated whiskey you drink, the less prominent the peat will be on your palate in the long run. So if you drink peated whiskey frequently, I drink it on a fairly regular basis. The peat doesn't quite stand out to me as it would for a beginner drinker. But that being said, this one is, you can definitely get that bonfire smokiness integrated. And what I really enjoy about this Lagavulin is I get a nice salted peanut characteristic to it. It's got a nice peanut-y uh, and the slightly fruity uh, background that's nicely integrated with that peat. Yeah. Yes. It's, de it's definitely sitting around a campfire yes. on the beach. Mm -hmm. And th this, is what it's, this is what it feels like. Oh, yeah. Very yeah, different feel. It's not, it's not a back room you know, overstuffed chair. No, no, not at all. I mean, this is a great one for like a nice winter's night. You know, it's snowing outside. You're sitting by the fireplace. You're sipping on some Lagavulin 12-year-old. I mean, it just adds to the the whole allure. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen the show uh, Parks and Recreation, but Lagavulin got a second run of fame uh, through their character Ron Swanson, played by Nick Offerman. And uh, he, dr he would drink frequent, uh, Lagavulin frequently on the show. So it got a spike in popularity when that Is that what on. happened? Uh, yeah, no. yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, but what do you think of this? Do you like the peated style whiskey? How, how you uh, how do you like it? You know, I think I like it for a few sips, mm -hmm. but I don't I don't know if I want to. I don't want to make a night of it. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, and that's actually kind of how I I approach peated whiskey usually in a flight. Right. But I'll that's just me. You know, my, yeah. uh, my Jimmy, my friend, he he. This is what he likes. This is yeah. this is his version of you know a good a, a good night's drink. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's so, there's so many different styles of peated whiskey that are well aged. Usually, the older the peated whiskey is, the less profound the peat is. It tends to kind of take a back seat once it's aged for 15, 20, 30 years. Um, so uh, if you like that sharp peatiness, a young peated whiskey is the way to go. Um, I'm, I'm, I do love peated whiskey, but I'm sort of like uh, in your, your camp too, where I like the non-peated a little bit better. I will reserve it for a dram in my flight as, as towards the end, um, just to kind of a contrast and enjoy that, that peated flavor. But, but I, am en I am enjoying... I am enjoying the aftertaste, you know, a few minutes. Oh, yeah. Ago. Yeah, the finish it, is nice. It's not unusual, It's and it's not it, – it's like a little bit of peanut. Yeah. Um, a little bit of, of the beach. Oh, know? yeah. Well, bonfire beach. You know, yeah. uh, beach is is different for everybody, but for me, it's, it's usually, a, um, you know, driftwood, driftwood yeah. smoke. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. Salt um, in the air. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know if you added a couple of drops of water to kind of see if it changed it, it all for you, but um, but yeah, I mean, and, and it did. Thing, it it, it um, smoothed it right out. Yeah, which is nice. It makes it a little bit more palpable, but the uh, just the, you can tell this uh, had such nice interaction with the casks. You get a lot of that that rich fruitiness from those ex bourbon casks that it's aged in. That's just so pleasant um, and well made for for a twelve year old whiskey. I I gotta say that this one. Um... This one talks you into it. It does. It does. The more you sip it and the less, the, the more the peat kind of takes a back seat. If your you palate. keep your mind open, if you don't just shut down. Oh yeah. And Absolutely. go, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you a chance. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it, it has, de it has debated back into a favor. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's, and I'm glad you said that because one of the most important things about anybody exploring whiskey, anything in life really is keep an open mind. If you go into it, 
saying I'm not going to like this, you're probably not going to like it. But if you say, all right, I'm willing to to I'm willing to figure this out and learn about this whiskey. Uh, more often than not, you're going to find reasons to like it. That's almost almost always. There are whiskeys that I will try a couple of times that I just don't like, and I will set it aside for a little while. I'll come back to it, and then I will it'll just click for me and be like, oh, I get what this whiskey's trying to tell me, and I'll really start enjoying each dram that I pour. So I mean, that's you have to have an open mind without a doubt. <laughs> it is essential in whiskey drinking. Well, maybe it was the five drinks before I got to this that, <laughs> yes. that has kept my mind open. Yeah, it's the funny thing about whiskey is the more you drink it, the better it starts tasting. So <laughs> that, that is the funny thing about whiskey, without a doubt. Yeah, and, and you probably enjoy a haggis after a few of these, too. Yeah, your, your uh, palate uh, opens up to a lot of different interesting f- foods as you drink the whiskey. But uh, so far, through these five whiskeys... The remarkable thing is they're all made from the same three ingredients, water, malted bar- or barley, and oak casks. And yet all five of them have been vastly different from each other. And that is why exploring whiskey is so incredible because this is just five, but every whiskey I have on my shelf back here provides a different experience, a different flavor profile based on its casks or where it was aged or how long it was fermented for or how long it was distilled for. It all provides a unique experience in the whiskey journey. Well, you can find that across the spectrum. Oh, yeah. You you go around the United States, you can find, uh, you know, a million different bourbons. You can find different barbecues, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, you know, the main ingredients in barbecue is meat. Then it yeah. depends on on what sauce and and how you and how you cook it, you know. So, absolutely, I love yeah. it. Just keeping an open mind, exactly, and it helps you keep an open mind, like you said, for other things. You know, it doesn't have to be just whiskey. Whiskey is a uh, a microcosm of what other opportunities are out there to learn and expand your your mind, basically. Yeah. Well, well, I All like right. that. I like that. Um, uh, the bourbon I, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, uh, the uh, Belvedere with the with the rum cask. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Balvenie. The, the Balvenie. Yes, right? yes, yes. Rum cask because it it was a little complex. I mean, I mean, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't the same thing right away. Mm-hmm. It had it had nice you know um, stages to it. Oh yeah, no, no. The the Balvenie fourteen was one of the first whiskeys I've ever actually bought. It was, uh, so it has a, a very fond place in my heart. I haven't bought it since then. Cause my, since then my, uh, my curiosity has taken me to different places in the whiskey world. But, um, yeah, without a doubt, it's a, it's a nice introduction to a cask finish in a whiskey that is unique and different. And it's, and it's a good segue into our final dram of the night, which in fact is a, is a rum. We are drinking a, uh, Barbados rum. It's called four square. Distilled in 2009, and this is our strongest dram of the night. Uh, we're looking at 60% ABV, so it's not for the faint of heart. And so, the reason why I'm saving this for the end is that. And where where was this distilled? So this is distilled in Barbados. In Barbados. Um, yeah. So this so, is a Barbados. So rum. we've left the Isle of of Scotland and Ireland. Yes, so we are no longer drinking whiskey. We are drinking rum, which is distilled from sugar or molasses, um, and this. Four Square Distillery, which uh, is the distillery in Barbados, makes rum for basically the whiskey drinker. They have ne- uh, so the, the thing you have to wor- know about rum is that there's no regulations. So most a lot of the store rums that you find, they'll have additives to it like sugar or coloring or you know uh, various things that alter the flavor of the rum. Whereas Four Square, they have the natural product. This is just twelve aged twelve years in an ex bourbon barrel, uh, straight spirit from sugarcane, basically. Well, that's what they used to do with tequila. They they yeah. you know, they would add they would add coloring to it, like you know, yeah. some type of caramel. Or, or yeah, whatever. yeah. And, you know, in, in full disclosure, a lot of scotch, scotch, the SWA, the Scotch Whiskey Association, they do allow you to add coloring to a whiskey as long as it doesn't alter the flavor. Uh, but most whiskey enthusiast whiskeys do not have coloring in it. They they state on the bottle natural color only. So the whiskeys we had tonight, I think for the most part, are all natural color. Um, oh, including the, the coloring drug. can also add to a headache. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that. No, no. So this is a 12-year-old rum, bottled at, um, bottled at 60%, uh, and basically, 
this is what I call the dessert dram, and I love having a rum or a bourbon right after a peated whiskey because that sharpness and that boldness cuts right through that lingering smoke on your on your palate, and it's just a nice kind of palate uh, uh, cleanser to some degree, and it's just that bold sweetness is a great way to finish up a, uh, a flight. So right off the bat, you can smell this is a different animal altogether, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you get like coconuts, you get some bananas in there, some vanillas, just on the pat on the nose. I love the idea of a dessert whiskey. Yes. No, uh, there's definitely dessert whiskeys out there. And I uh, bourbons and rums in general uh, are what I consider dessert because bourbon in general is super sweet, super bold. So if I have a nice Elijah Craig Barrel Proof or a Booker's or something like that at the end of my flight, that's the perfect way to end it just because that rich sweetness is a nice kind of uh, palate cleanser to some degree. Well, they, you know, in some of the bourbons, they've started making them even sweeter. Like a maple, yeah, maple yeah. bourbon, I, you know, it's like... Uh, you don't, sure yeah. yeah, I'm not sure about that either. For me, if I'm drinking a bourbon, it has to be a barrel proof. So it's got to be at like high 50%, low 60s. Because uh, in general, what, I find... What is your favorite bourbon? My favorite bourbon, my go-to bourbon is Elijah Craig barrel proof. Not the standard Elijah Craig. The barrel proofs are usually bottles around 60%. And uh, for me, since bourbon is a little bit more one-dimensional, you get those vanillas and those uh, that sweetness. Uh, I, I need that extra ABV to kind of integrate some of the nuances into that. So Elijah Craig barrel proof is usually my go-to. Um, you know, But I do like Booker's. I like Larceny barrel proof. I like um, yeah, a barrel bourbon is a nice blender of bourbons that uh, bottle barrel proof bourbons that it's it's really nice. So those are my usually go to uh, bourbons when I when I drink them. Um, but since I uh, since you're you're when I asked you what what kind of whiskeys you drank, uh, you s mentioned bourbons. I, that's why I left it out of the flight. I thought, all right, we'll stick to Scotch, we'll stick to Irish whiskey, and then we'll have a rum to finish it off with. Because most people don't know how good a rum can be. Hopefully, you uh, you enjoy this one. You're right. You're right. Well, b mainly because when they when they first encounter rum, it's in a punch. Exactly. It's yeah. in something that's you know blended up, and and it's it's not it's not a straight up shot usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. It's not. It's like an pina colada or something like that. Uh, right. But but this was designed. This was crafted to be drunk neat as is. So let me know what you think. Wow. Yeah. That's like a. You can tell the spice in it. I'm, I'm immediately adding some water to it. It's got such sweet, uh, like, vanillas and coconuts. And, and yeah, the aftertaste some, some... is there. But yeah. it, it's funny because the aftertaste is sweet, but the back of your mouth is still, like, you know, yeah, in shock from that first shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, add, definitely add a little bit of water, kind of tame it a little bit, um, and kind of bring out some of those more nuanced flavors to it. That, that's definitely needed for a 60% ABV, you know, 120 proof. That's, it's not your, uh, you know, your grandfather's whiskey. <laughs> well, like I said, I'm not, I'm not drinking this, you know, to get high. No. Drunk. It's, it's more, you know, and I, I only have like one or two shots. Yeah, know, yeah. You know, so. No, I no. I enjoy that, it. I want, I want, I want conversation. I, I yeah. Think. Yeah. I mean, for me, whiskey and, and rums like this, these are the, these are the, uh, ultimate cerebral drinks because they're so complex and interesting that you just, you can sit there for half an hour with the, just a half an ounce and just think about what, what is it? What are you tasting? What is the age? What, what are the, uh, what's got been going on in the years that that was, uh, aged in. And it kind of, it helps in, you know, for me, the, the best conversations are had over a nice glass of whiskey. So it kind of inspires some, some, well, a couple of drops of water really, really, uh, even this right out. Yes, it tames it. it. It brings it down. It brings it cuts out. out but it's still that got that, you know, uh, banana, coconut thing going on. Yeah, no, without a doubt. It's, uh, it, you know, that's what I always encourage, especially for barrel proof, cast strength uh, whiskeys or rums. You add a few drops of water. There's no harm in that. In fact, it can enhance your whiskey drinking experience. It just helps to bring out some of the flavors and tame some of that spiciness that hits your sinuses. Well, that might be, you know, because why I like to have a, um, ice. Yeah. You know, because it immediately adds a little softener. To yeah, yeah. So the, the ice, not only does it, and especially if you're going to use ice, using the big cube is the way to go because it dilutes the whiskey at a slower pace. So you're not right. going to overwater it. Um, 
you know the one the one drawback of ice and co and cooling your whiskey down is that sometimes that can suppress some of the flavor profiles that you're trying to look for um you know because it's you know, slowing down the molecules in the whiskey or in the in the drink that you're having so you don't get quite as much from it but um there, there's no wrong way to drink it uh i encourage people well they have you know they have those rocks that you can freeze yeah and yeah. add any water it just makes it colder just a little bit cooler like for me the ideal drinking temperature is right around 65 degrees ish so if you keep it roughly at room temperature it's a solid uh a solid way to experience it um and like i said uh always you know i encourage people always try it neat first and then drink it the, any way you want you understand what it's like neat and then if you want to add some ice add some ice if you want to add water uh add water do do whatever makes you happy um, cause there can be a pretentiousness that, that is associated with scotch or whiskey in general that, uh, is kind of unwarranted. So you just want to drink it in <laughs> any way that you find necessary. Uh, that's funny. Of the six we've had, do you, what was your favorite? What was your, uh, you know, your go-to of these six? The Anioc. The Anioc. All right. No, that's, that is a common favorite of most people who uh, I share flights with. I mean, it delivers such a wonderful, nuanced experience that that is a, a great choice for your your top top dram of the night. But uh, you know, I'm I'm really enjoying my mouth after after the uh, this last one. Yeah, the rum it it adds it has that nice lingering sweetness that just uh, kind of cuts through. It Robert says ex bourbon. Yeah, so that meaning that the rum the spirit that came after distillation was matured in ex bourbon casks for 12 years so that's where it comes that's what i mean by ex bourbon um okay. so rum aged in barrels that previously held bourbon that's ex bourbon means um and yeah no it's just it's such a nice sweet lingering flavor on your palate that just kind of uh care it it's a very long finish it just sticks with you how long how, or how many times can you um use a barrel um, you can use it quite a few times and, and in, in for bourbon, you can only use virgin oak casks, meaning only the casks can only be used one time before they have to ship it to Scotland, basically to age scotch for scotch. Usually, uh, you know, they can use it indefinitely basically, but the more it's used, the less oak characteristics that will come from it. So you'll have first fill ex bourbon, meaning it was the first filling of the cask, um, after the bourbon was in it and then you can have second fill meaning that scotch was in it they dumped it they filled it back up with scotch spirit um and then you can you can refill it after that but usually the, the more you use it the, the more the spirit characteristics characteristics will kick in and the less the barrel influence will kick in so um usually you have first fill or second fill um and then i'm sure some blends they'll use uh third fill you know and, and older barrels but uh you know for more of the uh whiskey enthusiast whiskeys it's usually first or second filled uh ex bourbon um if you're going to reuse them well they they will burn the the i mean mm -hmm. they will they will torch the inside yeah um, to get a can you retorch yeah yeah you can absolutely they uh they'll rechar it that's they call it recharring so after it's filled I'm wondering I'm where all of these millions of barrels you know end up yeah, uh, Chris from uh, Single Malt Savvy is uh, is saying that he's only seen fourth fill barrels a handful of times. So I guess first, second, and third fill are the are you know the the norm, and then fourth fill is going to be the end of the cycle, if at all. Um, you know, but yeah, to your point, they can be recharred. They can add uh, you know add to, to basically add some of those caramelized uh, sugary notes to it from the additional char and kind of uh, remove that most top layer of the the wood so that's um, where you know the the fourth and fifth use of a barrel is like where grappa happens yeah right yeah. you know grappa was like the dregs of wine until somebody figured out if you put it in a beautiful clear bottle you know you can sell it yeah yeah i haven't explored much with grappa but i know it does not have the uh the finest reputation out there well it it wasn't it, it was um you know like a lot of things it it was for people who couldn't afford a good bottle of wine. They they went with yeah. the grappa, yeah. Because you, know, yeah. you still got the kick. You got what you wanted out of it, but mm -hmm. it didn't have the flavor. And then once it became popular, once people that grew up with it all of a sudden had money, they could afford it. But they still liked the grappa. They made a better version of it. Yeah, kind of yeah. like you know, um, blackened fish or blackened chicken was a bad cut, 
of meat mm -hmm. that they yeah. had to blacken so that you didn't see the imperfections and then it became a taste it became, yeah, yeah you know it became cool yeah no without a doubt um it's, it's the history of how uh, various spirits and and alcoholic beverages are made is just fascinating it's it's such a cool background to how all this stuff be came to be what it is today yeah um no that's that's really cool all right so now that we finished our drams, I do have a couple of uh, questions for you before we we, uh, we wrap up for tonight. Um, you know the the decorative trim uh, that uh, that lines the wall with the floor. Um, do you think they call that molding because it was in the refrigerator for too long? <laughs> I don't think so, Tim. Yes. All right. That's. Uh, I was hoping that would be the response. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, obviously, that's uh, from one of the, the the episodes of Home Improvement, uh, where I think that was the the or the original. I don't think so, Tim. Right? It it was. Uh, it's it's what all of a sudden the writers realized what they had. You know, yes. Uh, which was kind of fun because I like uh, like you found out I wasn't originally cast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was just filling in, and as. I got to do, you know, one episode and then another and then another. They they were watching the audience and the audience all of a sudden was filling them in on what Tim and I were doing. And and really, it wasn't anything we were doing extra. We were just, I was just kind of filling a space until the other guy would come in. But yeah, our our two characters just kind of, uh, you know, melded. It, it really yeah. worked. Which was yeah, no, with, without a doubt, and uh, you know, obviously, my name being Tim, that was a, a line that I heard a lot growing up, so I'm I'm very familiar with it. And uh, uh, again, Chris from Single Malt Savvy, he did say that uh, if we didn't get that line at least once a night, that he would riot. So I'm glad I'm glad we could throw it in there. Um, but yeah, to to your point, that that was the the one of the best uh, you know combos of the show was that. You had Tim Allen, who is like the macho man, always goofing around, uh, you know, not super serious. And then you were like the juxtaposition of that character where you were competent, you were more sensitive, your, your character was more sensitive, and uh, you knew what you were doing on the show. So uh, it, it just, it worked perfectly hand in hand without a doubt. Yeah, well, you know, and then a couple of years in, they, they explored a, a version where you know i get to host the show and i fail miserably yeah, re yeah and realize that i'm not quite ready to take over yeah no I, I remember that episode i remember there's an episode too where you know tim allen comes in with a beard you come and shave so you had like the the set the opposite person well that was like the third or fourth season where they went back to the first episode yeah yeah and they had mrs binford as the tool time girl yeah. on organ uh you know mispronouncing his name and everything <laughs> yeah oh yeah, yeah. No, all those are those are those are all fantastic uh, episodes and memories, without a doubt. Um, uh, do you have like a uh, a favorite moment or favorite episode of your your time on Home Improvement? Uh, you know, the the whole thing is is thirty years ago now. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy how time flies. Uh, it does, it, it does, like like a fine scotch. Um, yeah, but and there there were there were times where it was really, really fun, really rewarding. Um, I, I, you know, I remember an episode where I, I, I got in an argument with the, with the um, showrunner because we weren't exploring something that I felt we should be exploring. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to articulate that. And, and, you know, I was kind of learning yeah. uh, along the way how to do that. And, you know, we came to an understanding and, and that was a really wonderful breakthrough, a really wonderful episode um, that I felt good about there. Uh, then there was the time, you know, where they brought in an, an outside writer and she had written uh, a script where Tim and Al go outside of tool time looking for a dress yeah. for his wife. And God, there was this there was this one moment that just it wasn't written. It just kind of like happened where, you know, Tim goes, well, what do you think about about this? Is this you think this is the right size? And, you know, I'm, I don't know, you know, I'm thinking, well, Al would know size, yeah. I don't think. And I, I had my tape measure, so I just whipped the tape measure out, <laughs> you know, threw it across the, the broad side of the dress. And I go, yeah, that's about right. That's the, you know. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And so just, you know, like little things like that were just, you know, uh, uh, were such a joy to explore and find. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, and I mean, you know, the, the watching the show through two different you know perspectives. First, when I was young, you know, you loved like the the, the humor and the slapstick comedy that uh, um, you know Tim Allen had. Uh, but then when I rewatched it uh, a couple of years ago, um, it you know you have a fully a completely different perspective of it. You know, you you appreciate the humor from it, but then you you enjoy the 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 more sensitive side of Al Borland and then the uh, Wilson. Uh, commentary is just uh, there's so much gold in all of his advice yeah. he gives Tim Allen that you have a, a whole new appreciation the older you get watching that show. Yeah, w Wilson was the moral of the story. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really absolutely. was. Yeah, no, but absolutely. I um, I I got to do a moment. Well, I didn't get to do it. I I I made the moment happen, mm -hmm. where I was I was explore. Whoops, sorry about that. I yeah, was no exploring worries. the. Um, the Disney lot and I came across a studio where they had dug down like three floors mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's like this um it looked like a moon the moon or or or, or uh, an asteroid I, I don't know what yeah bizarre sort of stalactites and I and I come back to Tim and I go Tim I found this set we got to use this set this is an amazing set and he goes what where you? come here you know, we go and again, it goes, okay, we got to use this. And so yeah. he goes and talks to, you know, uh, Michael Eisner, the head of Disney. And Michael goes, I don't know. You know, this is for the, this is for Armageddon. And, and I don't think the director will let us use it. Well, he talked the director into letting us use it if we don't air it till six months after the movie is open. Yeah. So they used the set as the basement of Wilson's house. Oh, that's, that is so cool. And and if you go back and, and see that, he's like, Tim goes, uh, Wilson, are you there? I'm, I'm down here, Tim. You know, and, and he opens yeah. the door, you know, to the basement. And it, it's just this giant asteroid. Yeah. And there's a, like a little space heater that Earl or Wilson is working behind, you know, for his heating his house. It yeah. Hysterical. yeah. No, that is that is such a cool uh, backstory to that episode. That's one I'm gonna have to go revisit uh, and, and check out just to because the the connection with uh, Armageddon and everything. That's so that's so cool. <laughs> I know, I know. That, no, that that is really cool. Um, all right. So if, uh, a couple of last questions for you. They're they're kind of random, not necessarily a, you know any real significance. So now that we have this enjoyable uh, whiskey flight, what's your uh, your drink of choice? Whiskey, wine, or beer? I would have to go with whiskey. All right. That's but what it, I was you know for. my palate changes, and I don't know if it's if it's seasonal. Or whether uh, I I don't know way more you know as I get older, um, my 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 palate changes and I will crave you, you know um, a tequilas for yeah. a while and then I'll go to bourbons and then I, and then I'll go to scotch and and for a while there it was you know a good cold beer after golf uh, and now it's not necessarily um, where my head is so uh, and then you know sometimes it's great to just take a break from it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you need those breaks. You know, when I went on a diet, I couldn't drink um, for like six, seven weeks because it, it um, what happens when you drink, your metabolism stops to let your liver take over to expel the alcohol. So your metabolism stops, uh, you know, digesting and, and, and things like that. So, but I found myself craving certain things that I would deny myself until, you know, a few weeks later. And then I'd have, I'd have that first drink and it was like so much better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, and that's another thing I always uh, encourage people to do is take a break for a while, uh, let your body reset a little bit, and then uh, you'll have a new appreciation for whatever. Yeah, uh, and allow whatever. yourself to change. Yeah, you know, it's like you don't have to go to the same thing all the time. You can, you can explore, and you know, like these these flights. You know, now, my, you know, my palate has opened up to explore a lot of different things. Yeah, no, that's that's a hundred percent right. A lot of it depends on the mood and the environment and whatnot. You're not it's a hundred degrees out. You're not going to necessarily pour yourself a dram of whiskey. It's just not the right, not the right uh, environment for that. Um, all right, so uh, this is the last question. I'll I'll get you out of here on this one. Uh, if you're going to share a dram of whiskey with four famous people, dead or alive, which four people are you picking? Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think I would stay closer to home. I mm -hmm. think I would, I, I would share one with my grandfather, with mm -hmm. my dad and my mom. 
All right. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, um, it would be interesting to say, you know, Abraham Lincoln or like that. But as you get older and you've lost loved ones, it's it's kind of uh, with an older mind, you can ask better questions. Oh, yeah. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I would go there. Yeah, no, no, I think that's the perfect answer because, um, you know, who you're experiencing this whiskey with or these drams with makes all the difference in the world. And if you can share it with your loved ones, you know, there's no there's no better place than that. Like, uh, you know, my my wife's uh, dad passed away five years ago and I know he was a whiskey drinker, but that was before I really got into whiskey. So uh, one of the things that I wish I could have done was really just sit down with him, share some of this whiskey and just talk, right. you know, and uh, you just wish you have those opportunities. So that that's the perfect answer. Um, all right, Richard, this was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, and hopefully, you know, if, if this is something you like, if you want to do whiskey tasting 2.0, we can, we can set this up for a few months down the road and we can jump back on here and chat some more. I had a bunch of questions here that we'll, we'll have to get to at a future session. Okay. Well, talk, uh, talk to your, uh, you know, to your audience and see if, if they would like that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I, I, the comments I've been reading as we've been chatting here have been all positive, and it seems like everybody's enjoying our conversation here. So uh, if this is something you enjoyed, and if you enjoyed these whiskeys in this flight, um, I can I can throw some uh, pretty interesting whiskeys down your way uh, in the coming months, and we can jump back on here and have a chat. Okay. All right, buddy. All right. I appreciate it. Have a good night. You take care. Good night, everybody. Right, thank you. Good night.